The initial fitness test, previously known as the PAST test, is one of the first hurdles that an Air Force Special Warfare candidate must overcome on their path to joining the Air Force Special Warfare community. The communities that administer the Air Force Special Warfare IFT are Special Reconnaissance, Combat Controllers, Pararescuemen, TACPs, along with their officer counterparts, STO, Crow, and TACPOs, as well as your specialists in EOD. Whether you're here because you're interested interested in joining one of those elite communities, or you're just wanting to know what it takes for those who do, by the end of this video, you will know what the initial fitness test is, the standards that will be expected of you, why the Air Force makes you take it, and how to crush it so you can be as best prepared as possible for the rigors ahead. This is the Air Force Special Warfare Initial Fitness Test. Before we begin our breakdown into the specifics of the IFT, we're going to briefly cover some high-level information to give you better context and perspective. Like all special operations jobs, AFSPEC war candidates will be expected to perform some baseline PT test as a gauge for their viability as a trainee. A majority of those who take the IFT will be civilians attempting to get a SWOV contract, which stands for Special Warfare Operator Enlistment Vectoring. In a nutshell, this contract gives you the opportunity to get into the Special Recon CCT, PJ, or TACP communities based on your performance, needs of AFSPEC war, and other criteria. In other words, if you're coming in as a civilian, you generally won't be able to get a guaranteed contract into one of these four communities. You just get a guarantee to get any of the four. If you have your eyes set on a specific community, you're going to have to put in the work to increase your chances of getting a shot into that community. So when you see SWO standards for the IFT, this is what we're talking about. Next, like any PT test, there are minimum standards you must meet. While you may get a contract with the minimums, we highly recommend shooting for much higher than them. As of right now, there are no published optimal standards for the IFT, so you'll be hearing some recommendations to shoot for from both Stu Smith and numbers we've obtained from Ones Ready, a podcast of a few active duty AFSPEC war guys who are dedicated to teaching and spreading the word of Air Force Special Warfare. Bottom line, don't just shoot for the minimums. With all that said, let's jump into the IFT. In order, the IFT consists of a max set of pull-ups in two minutes, then a two minutes rest, max set of sit-ups in two minutes, then a two minutes rest, max set of push-ups in two minutes, then a 10 minutes rest, a mile and a half run, then a 30 minutes rest, two 25 meter underwater swims with a three minute rest in between, then a 10 minutes rest, and ends with a 500 meter swim. If you plan on joining as an officer, your IFT will be a little bit different. Everything else remains the same, but you only get one minute for the pull-ups, your run will be three miles long, and and your swim will be 1500 meters long. Also, the SEER and EOD communities do not test on every portion of the IFT. We will let you know which events don't apply for them during our breakdown. Now that you know the events of the IFT, the test sounds pretty simple, right? Wrong. At a first glance, the IFT seems easy, but many people fail, and many people barely pass the minimums, which only puts them in a precarious position for the pipeline. There's an entire science to special operations PT tests like the IFT, so much so that Stu Smith, a former Navy SEAL, has spent decades helping people maximize their PT test scores and leading them to success in training and beyond. We're excited to have him here with us today to share his insight on the AFSPEC War IFT. Among other things, he's a certified strength and conditioning specialist who's written several books on the topics of training and preparing for special operations selection, which you'll be able to find in the description below if you're interested. You'll be in good hands with him. Without further ado, what's up, Stu? General Discharge, thanks for having me on again. For you guys who do not know me, my name is Stu Smith. I am a former SEAL and I am a current tactical fitness writer. And what that really means is I work out and write about it, focusing primarily on the tactical professions. The thing that I like to teach are three phases of tactical fitness. And the first phase is you have to pass a fitness test to get accepted into this training. And that is exactly what the Air Force Special Warfare initial fitness test is all about. You pass this fitness test, you are accepted into the training pipeline. Phase two of tactical fitness is actually training specifically to get through the special ops selection program. And that requires you to seriously up your game with fitness and training specifically for the challenges that you are about to endure. And phase three, 
is the operator fitness. What exactly do you need to do as an operator in any of these professions to maintain your abilities, not only in the tactical side, but also the physical fitness side? Because one day your fitness will be a determining factor in saving a life. And that life may be yours, your buddies, or someone you needing to help. So it is that seriously. So when we talk about initial fitness tests, that is the mindset I want you to go into when you understand and yes, you have to do pull-ups and push-ups and sit-ups and run a mile and a half and do a 500 meter swim. That is the initial fitness test in a nutshell, but I'm going to break it down for you piece by piece and we'll get started right now. Glad to have you on here again with us, Stu. To drive home the point he's making, there's a reason why the I in IFT is initial, because this test is just the beginning of your AFSPEC war experience. Regardless of what's ahead of you, you still got to take it and crush it. So on that note, let's dive into the breakdown of the IFT, starting with the pull-ups. You'll be performing the pull-ups on, you guessed it, a pull-up bar. You'll do as many proper pull-ups as you can in two minutes, or one minute if you're an officer candidate. Pull-ups are a two-count exercise. Starting position is hanging from a bar, palms facing away from the candidate with no bent in elbows, dead hang, and the head in the neutral position, eyes facing forward. Hand spread is approximately shoulder width apart. Count one, pull the body up until the chin is above the highest point of the horizontal plane of the bar maintaining the neutral position. Count 2. Return to starting position. Legs are allowed to bend, but must not be kicked or manipulated to aid upward movement. The only authorized rest position is the starting position. Adjustment of the hands is permitted, but if the candidate falls off, releases from the bar, or the candidate uses the ground to rest or assist in the exercise, the exercise is terminated. If the candidate's feet inadvertently touch the ground, the repetition will not be counted. If the exercise is terminated, the repetitions performed prior to termination will be recorded. Stu, what you got for us on the pull-ups? Okay, the first exercise of the IFT is the pull-up. One of my favorite exercises because it is the hardest. I like it when it's right up front because most people fail this test out of all of the events. So first exercise, real easy, pull-ups, palms away. Uh, you can put your thumbs on however you want. I personally like to do it this way and you got to get your chin over the bar and you have to straighten your elbows when you're in the down position that's when you can rest too you can rest in the down position and you're on your own count so there's no cadence to this and you just get as many as you can now the minimum standards is just eight this is literally the minimum standard to get into the training and if you pass the minimum standards you have an opportunity to attend the special warfare candidate course after basic training and if you can't do eight pull-ups for the special warfare open enlistment or 12 for the officer side your spec ops days are done for the day so you need to practice these fitness tests on your own for months before you take it for real it is that important to your spec ops future that you're not just training without assessing yourself because if you're not assessing you're just guessing your performance it's not too hard to do right there's no reason why you can't do double digits in this test in fact i personally recommend you be able to do twice as many as that and if you can get up to 20 that's kind of the gold standard in my opinion thanks Stu. on screen now are the minimums for each respective community for you to pass this event the yellow number is the recommended score that you should be shooting for after a two minute rest you're going to move on to sit-ups eod does not perform this event for the ift you have two minutes to perform as many proper sit-ups as possible. Sit-ups are a two-count exercise. Starting position is back flat on the surface, fingers interlocked behind the head, head off the surface, and knees bent at approximately a 90 degree angle. Candidate's feet will be placed under a toehold bar or held by another individual. Count one, sit up so that the back is perpendicular to the surface. Count two, return to the starting position. The exercise is continuous. If the member's buttocks rises from the surface or his fingers are not interlocked behind his head during the repetition, the repetition is not counted. There is no authorized rest position, so if the member stops, the exercise is terminated. 
That's huge. You must learn how to pace yourself during these two minutes. If the exercise is terminated, the repetitions performed prior to termination will be recorded. Stu, what say you about the sit-ups? Sit-ups is also one of my favorite because it is the easiest to fix if you screw it up. And what I mean by that is you need to practice some sit-ups. Yes, you can do some other activities like flutter kicks and hanging knee ups to work the hip flexors because it is largely a hip flexor and a little bit of abs as well. Exercise, and you only need 50 in two minutes. The minimum standard here is very low. Here's where a lot of people screw up sit-ups is they start off way too fast. If you start off way too fast in the first 30 seconds and let's say you get 35 or 40 in 30 seconds, which is not hard to do, chances are you're not going to match that in the next minute and a half. Yeah, you may hit the minimums, but I've seen a lot of people just completely gas out in the first 30 seconds and they're they're done within a minute. But you get two minutes to do this test. Pace yourself. It's like starting off a mile and a half run and you're sprinting the first quarter at like 55, 60 seconds chances are you're not going to be able to maintain that pace and you're going to just gas out and have nothing left and be probably a lot slower even though you had that really fast first attempt at the 25 percent of the test here's what i do i've seen people fail that test one day two days later come back and pass it with significantly better scores for instance my own story where i was at the naval academy i got 64 my first fitness test i needed 65 and first fitness test i ever took i actually failed now the second one i got 80 and by the end of the semester, I maxed it, which was like at 100. So there's no reason why you can't double that minimum standard and be way above average candidate on that. I recommend doubling all these minimum scores, 80 to 100 sit-ups. Good stuff, Stu. Here are the minimums for you to pass this event, as well as the recommended numbers. After a two-minute rest, you will move on to do push-ups. EOD does not test on this event for the IFT either. You'll do as many proper push-ups as you can in two minutes. Push-ups are a two-count exercise. Starting position is hands, approximately shoulder width apart. Arms, back, and legs must remain locked, straight, and feet together. Count one. Lower the body until the elbows are bent at a 90 degree or lower angle and parallel shoulder to elbow to the ground. Count two. Return to the starting position. The only authorized rest position is the starting position. If the knees touch the ground, the exercise is terminated. The exercise will also be terminated if the candidate raises their buttocks in the air, sags their middle to the surface, or raises any hand or foot from their starting position. If the exercise is terminated, the repetitions performed prior to termination will be recorded. Let's see what Stu has to say on the push-ups. So, next exercise is push-ups. I'm not going to beat a dead horse with this one. Push-ups are pretty classic. Every military branch still uses push-ups, and they tend to have this very similar grading criteria. That means your arms are straight in the up position, head's neutral, your back is straight, and you come down, your elbows need to break 90 degrees. Sometimes you have a, a fist down there or a hand down there, or you have to touch your chest to the ground. Whatever the standard is, just do it in the Air Force. What they're looking for is hands just about shoulder width apart, your back stays straight, your head stays neutral, and you're breaking 90 in the down position, but you're also zero angle on your elbows in the up position. That's it. Being able to do 40 in two minutes, not that hard. You're, you should be able to do 75, 80 you know, before you go to basic military training, in my recommendation. Here are the minimums for the push-ups, as well as the recommended numbers. With push-ups done, you're all wrapped up with the calisthenics. You'll have a 10-minute rest, where you'll then conduct the run. The run will be a mile and a half for enlisted, and three miles for the officers. Here's a quick note from Stu on why officers have a different standard. It's a little bit more competitive for the officers. This whole process is, because they just need fewer, so they've raised the standards up for the officers. And you want the officers to lead by example anyway, so it, it's logical. In, in spec war, it's they don't make that differentiation, but they expect it. The officer selection and other spec ops programs are equally challenging because they literally need about 15% of the community to be officers. So it's just more competitive. Okay, 
Now to get into the run event. Physical training or PT clothes and running shoes are the only required items. The run must be conducted on an accurately measured course with no more than a 2% incline on any portion of the course, preferably a running track. The test administrator starts the timing device upon instructing the candidates to start and will announce and annotate the time elapsed to each candidate as they complete each lap. The run will end once you've run your prescribed mileage. Stu, what do you have for us on the run? Now, the minimum times for this mile and a half for the enlisted is 1020. So that's just under a seven minute mile pace. There's no reason why you can't be flirting with a six minute mile pace on this and be closer to nine minutes in my opinion. And for the officers, that three mile is 22 minutes, which is just over a seven minute mile pace. And once again, there's no reason why you can't be flirting with a six minute mile pace on the three mile timed run. So it is very doable. You just have to actually practice these paces. So what I recommend, if you're nowhere near the seven minute mile pace, let's say you're at an eight minute mile pace and your current mile and a half is 12 minutes. My recommendation is your new goal pace is now a seven minute mile. So subtract a minute, that's your new goal pace. So every interval that you run is now at that pace. So let's say on Monday, you're going to do 10 400 meter intervals. Each one of those need to be at a seven minute mile pace, which is a minute 45. Take a minute rest or maybe a hundred meter walk in between each set. And you're going to slowly learn how to run a seven minute mile pace if you hit those quarters at 145 where a lot of people screw up even on this workout is they're hitting it at 90 you know a minute 30 or they're hitting it at 150 155 and you really want to nail down the pace that is key now obviously the three mile time to want run is twice as hard as the mile and a half so your conditioning needs to adjust to that distance but also learn that pace it's the same pace there's no reason why your fast timed runs in any fitness test can't be a six minute mile pace especially if you're going in spec ops world you don't want to be flirting with any minimum standards when you're going through these spec ops training pipelines because there's a 70 percent attrition rate so you want to be in the top 30 percent at least work hard so your minimum standards is nowhere near these published minimum standards here's the minimums for the run as well as the recommended numbers after the run the ift is now over for seer and EOD candidates. For everyone else, you'll have a 30 minute rest. Yes, 30. 3 0. This should give you ample time to eat a snack, drink some electrolytes, and prepare for the pool portions coming up. Any words on the 30 minute rest, Stu? That's not necessarily designed to be a rest. It's really more of a transition from your calisthenics and running area to the pool. And sometimes that transition takes more than 10 minutes, which I like this 30 minute rest. It gives you a little time to go into the showers, cool down, hydrate, get some electrolytes in you, because chances are any Anytime you swim last, you're going to cramp up in some way, especially if it's hot and you're sweating profusely outside when you're taking this test. You definitely need to watch your fuel and your hydration because that is probably the biggest killer out of all of these is just that people can't finish the test due to cramping of some sort, much less, you know, meeting the minimum standards. Thanks for that, Stu. All right, now you're going to move on to do two 25 meter underwater swims for completion. There's a three minute rest between each underwater. This exercise is two three minute cycles consisting of an underwater swim and surface swim back to the starting point. Candidate will take a breath, submerge, push off the pool wall and swim 25 meters underwater. Candidate will then surface swim any stroke to the starting point. The second underwater cycle starts at the end of the first three minute period. Complete the second cycle as listed above. If candidate breaks the water surface during any portion of the underwater swim, the component will be completed but considered a failure of this event. Again, if any part of you breaks the surface before you complete the underwater swim, even if it's the back of your head, that is a failure. Stu, give us your wisdom on the underwater swim portion. So the first event is a 25 meter underwater swim. 
and you get to kick off the wall, go underwater. You can swim any method you want underwater. However, the preferred method is to try to get over to the other side in as few strokes as possible just to save some energy. And the way you do that is to be really streamlined when you kick off the wall. So one hand on top of the other, biceps on your ears, kick off the wall like you're doing a vertical jump. So a lot of power goes into the legs off that wall and just shoot off that wall like a torpedo. Then when your hands are up here, pull them down really hard doing what is called a breaststroke pullout. You can Google that term and you will see people much better at swimming than I, showing you how to do a great double arm pull that gets you nearly halfway across the pool before you're even finished with your first stroke and kick off the wall. After that, it is a streamlined recovery and kick, and you get those hands back over your head into a streamlined position again, hold that glide a little bit after the kick, and then you double arm pull again. There's no reason why you can't get 25 meters in four strokes across the pool with a kickoff, but you got to glide to do it. Where a lot of people screw this one up is they're just constantly, you know, just swimming and kicking vigorously to get across the pool and they wonder why they're dying on the other end. You can literally walk and hold your breath for 25 meters and feel the same as kicking off the wall and gliding, you know, throughout this stroke to get to the other side. So if you want to think of a sequence for this stroke, it's kick off the wall, glide, double arm pull, glide, kick and recovery, glide. So it's pull, glide, kick, glide, pull, glide, kick, glide. And you do that. I've seen guys do it in three. So if you're really efficient, and your streamline, you'll get across that pool really quickly. Now, what you have to do is swim back freestyle or side stroke, you can do whatever you want, but you have a three minute period in between completion of that 25 yard. You start, your timer starts coming back. And when you get back, you'll probably have two minutes to rest before you have to do it again. It's plenty of time. And then you do it a second time. Now I will say this, never swim underwater alone. Never swim by yourself. Have somebody on the pool deck, have a lifeguard, you know, be in a public pool with a lifeguard. And if you're ever doing underwaters, make sure the lifeguard knows you're doing underwaters. Just because people die every year practicing breath holds and underwaters. And you can search this on the internet. It's tragic when you find out they're a spec ops candidate. Please be careful with that. After you complete your underwater swims, you'll have a 10 minute rest. Next up is the last event, which is a 500 meter surface swim or a 1500 meter surface swim for the officers. This swim is conducted using the freestyle, breaststroke, or side stroke. The swim is continuous. If a member stops, for example, rests holding on the side of the pool anytime or uses the bottom of the pool to assist, the test will be stopped and considered a failure of this event. Once you complete the swim, the IFT is now over. Stu, what do you got for us on the swim? Next exercise, 500 meter swim. And cool thing about this is you have your choice of what stroke you want to use. You can mix and match it if you like, but personally, pick one that works for you and stick to it. Uh, you'll probably be faster that way versus like thinking you're just going to start off freestyle and you're going to rest with the breaststroke. That's just slowing you down. So actually get into swimming shape so you can crush this 500. And if you're an officer candidate who has to take a 1500 for a test, you definitely need to get into swimming shape because that requires another level of swimming. In fact, I have a workout that's a great swim workout that we call the 50-50 where you do 50 meters really hard of freestyle and you try to catch your breath with a breaststroke or CSS and you do that 10 times, but you always warm up with a 500 yard swim or you can all cool down with a 500 yard swim. Something I also like to do when I'm in the pool, anytime that I'm in the pool, I practice treading because I will tell you later in your spec ops pipeline, you will be treading significantly. So what I like to do is when I'm doing swimming training, you know, like swim a couple hundred yards in a set and then catch my breath with one of the treading events. So you're catching your breath with treading with no hands, do something like that, that way you can implement more into your swim training than just swimming because there is a great deal of pool competency that is involved in you getting through selection. Like I said, getting into selection is about passing this IFT. Getting through selection is training specifically for what your future training holds. And I promise you, 
you will see a lot of pool time when you're going through this pipeline. Here's the minimums for the swim, as well as the recommended numbers. Stu, do you have any closing thoughts on the IFT? It's a great one. It's one of my favorite fitness tests. I still use the Navy's version as kind of my standard, even in my 50s. You know, with uh, it's just a different order, but the same events. Make sure you can go well above the minimum standards. If you're flirting with any of the minimum standards, here's where it's dangerous. You're probably going to lose a little bit of conditioning. So those minimum standards are now out of reach and you're going to fail that test whenever you get into the prep course. Hopefully they let you stay there and take it again and get in a little bit better shape because they do understand that basic military training deconditions you and that's why they created the prep course. I promise you, if you wait to take this fitness test for the first time with an instructor or recruiter, mentor in your area, chances are you may not do very well. Like I have seen people show up for their first fitness test and not know how to swim. I'm like, what were you thinking? Did you think you just magically learn how to swim? Practice these events. That's how you're going to get better at them. And if you notice, it's all calisthenics and cardio. So you need to have a phase of your training specifically addressing calisthenics and cardio. We typically do this throughout the year, depending on when our fitness tests are. We drop the weights and we focus hard on all the calisthenics and cardio events of that IFT or PST or whatever fitness test that you are taking. If you're trying to crush the IFT, make sure your workouts are looking like the IFT meaning you have an upper body day of pull-ups, push-ups, and sit-ups. You have a lower body day of running and swimming and you know squats and lunges just to work on some muscle stamina there as well. Add some fins on leg days just to practice what you're going to see in the future. Add treading to every workout. There's no reason why you can't swim five days a week. If you're a non-swimming athlete, you definitely need to be in the pool that long, that many times a week in order to get into swimming shape. Running shape is not the same as swimming shape. You have to practice this stuff. My number one mission as a fitness writer is to help people get to and through the training. And that's what programs like this is, is for. Do yourself a favor, practice everything you need to practice and do not leave it the chance. Because like I said in the beginning, if you're not assessing, you're just guessing. And you don't wanna leave your spec ops hopes and dreams up to a guess. So general discharge, that's all I have, sir. Thanks for having me on again. You guys check out the other one we did recently with the uh, Navy PST, and you'll see some similarities in that style of training. Until next time, sir. Thank you. Have a good one. Stu, thank you so much for joining us here again. It was a pleasure having you. If you haven't already, we highly recommend you go check out Stu's book on Air Force Special Warfare, as it is designed to get you prepared for the IFT and beyond. He's also authored countless articles having to do with tactical fitness. The links to his book and website will be in the description below. If you were wondering where we were getting the minimum numbers, test procedures, and the instructions from, it's from this document right here, the Official Aspect War IFT PDF. You can find this online with a simple Google search, but we'll make it even easier for you and leave it in the description if you want to check it out. Also, if you want to hear about the IFT in more depth, the SWOV program, or Air Force Special Warfare in general, we highly recommend and you go check out once ready. The link to their channel will be in the description below. You can't get around it. The Air Force IFT is an event everyone needs to conquer to do some sort of spec ops job in the Air Force. Train hard and smart, and if you listen to what was said in this video, you will be well on your way. One of the best things to help you even further is by getting some good gear to help out your training. With rising prices everywhere, you gotta save money where you can. Attack Leap, a veteran-owned company, sells amazing gear at an affordable price for those who want to pass AFSPEC War Selection. If you use our code General Discharge at checkout, you can get an extra 10% off. The link to their website is in the description and pinned comment below. Well, that is the down and dirty of the Air Force Special Warfare Initial Fitness Test. If you learned something from this video, make sure to give us a like and subscribe to our channel. As always, thank you for watching. Do you even want to be here? A special thank you to all of our supporters on our Patreon and YouTube membership. If you'd like to be featured in our videos, consider joining and go check out the links in our description below. Your contribution is greatly appreciated and will help us create more great content. All your friends are subscribing to General Discharge and you don't even want to be here.